Hey everyone, my name is Fabian and this is Bitcoin Book Club on HODLcast. Today, we go over chapters 1 through 7 of Jonathan Beer's The Block Size War. Bitcoin has a very interesting history, and this was a great segue from the Book of Satoshi, a book that we read last time. If you haven't seen that discussion, go ahead and check those out as well. We had a great time talking about his, uh, the book with Phil Champagne. Hope you enjoy and stay tuned for next week as we go over chapters 8 through 14. One more thing, if you want to start your own book club, I've left a link to the materials that I've used below for you to use as you wish. Alright guys, hope you enjoy and see you next time. But yeah, so that's that. How did you guys think of the book? I think, uh, yeah, what do you guys think of the book so far? It's like, it's like Battle of the Nerds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. I, I think it's very good. I, I actually finished it because I've been doing a lot driving this week. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm so mad at you <laughs> for finishing the book, dude. Like, <laughs> all right, whatever. We'll make do. <laughs> what do you think, Max? I, I really liked it. Like I said, I um, I know Kenny recommended it in the, the summer and I kind of started with the audiobook for a bit. Um, didn't finish it at that point, but I, I think it was a really good like segue from uh, Book of Satoshi, right? And then um, moving mm. into this and it, it, somewhat similar to, to a lot of like newer projects today now too, where it's like the similar argument that's being made, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I thought it was super interesting. Um, as well, it's interesting you'd hear, like, I don't know, do you guys follow, like, the kind of Bitcoin devs now on uh, Twitter or whatever, but, like, you'd see a lot of them, there's been, a lot of them are mentioned throughout the the book, and it's just kind of like, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's super interesting. So I kind of want to talk about Brian Armstrong, but we'll get to that later. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's, and it was so funny to see um, Gavin and like people from the Book of Satoshi, like like almost like characters that I liked in Book of Satoshi. Like it was like <laughs> reading the sequel. Like I saw them again. It's like yeah, Gavin's in there, and he's like portrayed in a good light here. You know, <laughs> like so it's really cool that uh, you know it's nonfiction, but it feels like uh, like you know fiction. So um cool so the big levels of contention i think the whole book is out and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this but the whole thing was is um level of block space inside the block modifying the rules in the protocol the significance of nodes for ordinary users and time preferences and i, and I guess this is you feel this in like all these chapters um and one of my thoughts that I was thinking is like, I learned about Bitcoin now and everything seems right now. And I mean, we, we could say that Bitcoin hasn't been altered since, um, but it's like looking at what they were arguing, I feel like obviously I'm not smarter than these guys, but I'm like, how could they not see this? You know, I don't know. What did you guys think about the issues that were brought up or like your general thoughts on that yeah well i suppose look, with the whole book um i remember because i was actually i was in bitcoin at, well throughout some of this uh at the time and the narratives weren't clear then so hindsight's a great thing like the, they're very clear to us now like what i suppose that um or at least to me anyway that uh like bitcoin it's much more important the, the unchangeability of the whole thing and like maintaining the kind of well i know there are changes but the change in the block size would have been massive and it would have basically enabled corporates to just come in later on and just well kind of bastardize the whole thing um at a later date and at the time it, it, none of this like lightning wasn't really a thing it wasn't clear how it was going to scale and like, I remember I used to like the kind of, you know, the old coin narratives. I used to buy that and I lost a lot of money doing that kind of thing. But um, 
like you know like all these new coins that like it was faster and this was going to be the new thing so like all these what like litecoin that was a big one but there was even weirder ones like digibyte and like they were all spin-offs of bitcoin and like if looking uh, it's a lot of the same guys that are still in those communities that believe this kind of speed scale narrative when that's not really what it's all about it's all you know like the monetary revolution um whereas like the big blockers seem to see it as a uh, you know like a new paypal or something and that's what they this it's, real it, world yeah yes and yeah and i think with the what i found very interesting as well and is the narrative switch like back then a lot of the bitcoin developers they thought that um it was kind of like very much from like a, a tech company perspective that we need to like keep scaling this and make this product better and better and better even though that's not really that's not the narrative now at all the narrative now is that it's you know the, the foundation monetary Check layer the network get more energy yeah. into it get more nodes self-custody everyone running yeah. node like that is like the core tenants right of like initiation into bitcoin yeah like back then it was all payments you know um well a lot of it was there obviously was that narrative there that's there now but it's so much smaller and i suppose that would be called the small blockers in this book um and it and it took time to for that to proliferate and now now you just have someone like michael saylor talking about like you know all day every day yeah um yeah that's what i i found very interesting and anyway, it's just yeah very interesting how the narrative now has has developed and it's like kind of solidified that and i i think a lot of the guys would would recognize this themselves anyway now that were involved in at the time because like yeah, like all, all those guys have kind of gone quiet and the same thing then happened. And now I know it's skipping ahead to the end of it, but the, with- No, Bitcoin don't Satoshi, spoil it. Do not <laughs> fucking spoil it. <laughs> well, well, it's all public. No, okay, I won't say anything. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Just like with what happened with Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision then. So like they had, Bitcoin, BSV was like the coin made by Craig Wright. They called Craig Wright. They call him like fake, fake, fake Toshi. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's the guy. Yes. Yeah, so, so just what, in short, what happened with that is they had their own split, Bitcoin Cash and BSV, and it's kind of just destroyed the two of them now. Like, whereas Bitcoin Cash had a bit of momentum before. So, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, so let's introduce the uh, antagonists. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Gavin. Gavin and Mike are, are obviously cool people, but like they're definitely on the, I don't want to say the wrong side of history, but you guys get what I mean. Um, yeah. And it was really cool because I forgot, I didn't forget, but yeah, Gavin was a part of the Bitcoin faucet. So yeah. uh, he was talking to Satoshi and like when that all happened and how he wanted to fix that, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then Mike Hearn, I didn't want to, I didn't want to write down, he used to work at Google. I feel like that's not important, but I still need to mention it for some reason because everyone else does. So <laughs> Mike Hearn used to work for Google, right? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, sp I suppose it is relevant in, in a little bit of a sense because like in, it kind of encapsulates like the you know, like Google would be tech. So it has to keep but, getting better, better, it, better, better, better. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the fallacy of appealing to, uh, the fallacy of authority or the fallacy of appealing to authority. What What is that? You guys know that fallacy? It's like, because someone has a title that they're automatically yeah. on a pedestal or something. Yeah, yeah I, I understand. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know the exact term, but I know what you mean. So Bitcoin XT, I always called it XL or like I always want to call it XL. Um, but yeah, so that's the main point, right? This is the the kernel of where this all started. Um, and you know what I was looking for? Because because this was a thing that I. That's we say Bitcoin is a cash final cash settlement, right? And that is what it's intended. 
And I tried to look through the white paper, but I couldn't find cash settlement. There was um, cash transactions, there was electronic transactions, but there was no saying there of cash settlement. And for some reason, I feel like um, in, in uh, the Bitcoin standard, it was mentioned that Satoshi meant it as a cash settlement. I guess we all think it's a cash settlement, but I couldn't find it, I guess is what I'm trying to say in the white paper. Yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, and I think we mentioned this previously in um, one of our other discussions, but like he does kind of talk about it in that sense in like the book of Satoshi, say in the emails, he talks about like the Austrian economics perspective, but maybe, yeah, it's, it's not in the white paper. I think like a lot of the Bitcoin Cash guys or like the big blockers use this then as a kind of... Um, like a justification to yeah, raise yeah. the block size when it was a bit, it was disingenuous, really, I suppose. Yeah, very short term thinking, right? Just to optimize the, the current current product. Yeah, because if it, like what, well, it seems kind of obvious to me um, now. Maybe you guys might differ, but like if if they did raise that block size, it's likely it would have been raised again now. And then that means that other things that were fundamental to the protocol could be changed as well. So like the government's just going to come in then and just start fire all their resources at it to destroy it until like, you know, if it's maybe it wouldn't even have happened yet, but if if it's actually a threat to the existing financial system, it just seems like inevitable. And I think they will st still try and do that, but now it'd be a loss, a lot trickier to pull off, I, I think anyway. And, and I think the, the route they would go to, obviously the protocol is going to be one or like the network, but the other, I think they're just going to try to mess with the markets now, right? And I'm not saying they, mm. but like that is another angle of attack is the markets, not um, in addition to the network. Yeah, so like, I, I think that like how they would have done it if this had happened, they would have gone after the protocol itself but like now they're going to go after the on-ramps and stuff which exactly. makes the protocol yeah a lot safer well i suppose max it's up to you to hold the line <laughs> with the on-ramp thing <laughs> they, they'll be closing off the on-ramps max will be trying to process as many as he can <laughs> Yeah, get, of, get get into the mining too, or, or some non KYC stuff. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and one thing that I noticed, so th so so there's a lot of letters of support from Gavin and like the <laughs> the 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 bigger block boys, right? The big block boys, um, and I just thought it was so funny. I mean, just like. It's like it's like these guys that want the bigger blocks. It's like we have these companies behind us, right? And and here was BitPay, Blockchain.info, Circle, uh, KNC Miner, ItBit, BitNet, and I tried to see where these companies were. Like a quick Google search. Some of them were bought out. Some of them kind of just stayed being their own thing. But um, it really yeah, just it, ended. Go ahead. I was just gonna say ItBit or Paxos now. They're yeah yeah uh powered by paxos or something like that yeah um, yeah well, well i think paxos bought them but like this their whole exchange kind of side of things is uh it yeah um and then it really was a as as i was reading through the chapters it started feeling more like grassroots yeah, like grassroots small blockers versus like companies that got together that wanted to make changes. And that's very against, you know, how I've come to know Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Vemos, he was an interesting character. I think he actually did a lot. Uh, does anyone remember what he did or what the what was uh, surrounding him? 
You just like start deleting them all. Didn't not, not deleting, just like saying we don't want you here. <laughs> but in a nice <laughs> way, it was said in such a nice way. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Bitcoin client was interesting. Um, the first Bitcoin client was all in one. And now everything is so separated. Um, I tried to post a photo here of like what the basic one looked like, but I think this is a nice version of what it looked like too. Um, and mm. yeah, Satoshi setting up. So so the, the one megabyte block limit wasn't even in the original, original protocol. That was something Satoshi implemented later. Does anyone remember what the what people wanted to do with that, like what they thought Satoshi meant by doing that? I phrased the question wrong. But. I, I think he meant that, uh, uh, yeah, didn't they, didn't Satoshi say something like that could be changed at a later date? Is yeah. that what you're alluding to? Yeah, but like, again, this is just one of those things as well that like, I kind of think that Satoshi's not a god. And like when he said that, he probably spent like, you know, like 90 seconds thinking about it and then just type, yeah, that can be changed at later date. It doesn't yeah. mean that it should have been changed. And I think he actually said that later on again. Okay. Um, but yeah, but again, that that's another thing that was used by like the, the big blockers and to justify the change, kind of misquoting. And this is not in this full context, like, Happy accidents. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Satoshi came back from the grave. <laughs> like, like what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> guys. I don't know yeah, about you, but like every other chapter, I was like, Jesus Christ! Like, so much shit could have gone wrong, and like, <laughs> we're okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, no, I think he about that. To that when it, when I when I heard that, it was uh, really interesting. Like how how concrete he was, like his vision on it and everything, and his own like perspective. And then obviously, like just that being shut down, like yeah, it was just hacked, uh, and even like made that entire like discussion like more and more hostile too. So yeah, really really interesting, but. Uh, even I was like thinking, like, was he was he maybe hack or so? But it, it definitely sounds. I might have to look at it more closely, but just from the like tone and everything, sounds like something like him. But uh, just interesting to see that he was like so firmly against growing it, um, and and really looking at like the longer like time, uh, longer preference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If it feel um. Phil needs to do an edit on his book to include that because, like, he, you know, <laughs> yeah, he does. Like, it's fairly important. Like, <laughs> that, what, what was said there? Well, like, <laughs> no one talks, no one, I've never heard anyone mention this before. And it's like, there's only two options hacked email or it was him. And both of those are like high probability, you know, I, I don't know. I yeah, I don't know. I, I think it probably was him. him. I because I think he must have. Well, look, I don't know. Maybe he was thinking like, "Oh, Jesus, uh, this is going to ruin Bitcoin or something." I need to. I need to come back <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> but th this was quite different from the "I'm not Dorian Nakamoto," right? This was like not mm -hmm. like uh, in the like <laughs> something we see in the movies. Like you know, I'm not one line period this was like this it reminded me of because are you we're familiar with the bible right yeah you know there's like many versions of the same book right and it's like different authors copied the book and they're all saying like my name's paul and this is don't believe anyone else except for me you know <laughs> and it's like that's what satoshi's like email reminded me of is like i'm satoshi believe it's me we only want one mega box one megabyte you know like uh. <laughs> well if, if yeah, it was 
if it was hacked, it's a good, uh, it's a good hack. <laughs> it's very good. And, yeah, and it doesn't help that apparently, like the other email account got hacked, right? Someone mm-hmm. just got in, yeah. got his password or something. Mm-hmm. I'm curious <laughs> yeah, what that right. password was. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is written on paper, but like the one password he didn't, you know. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, I, I dug up the, the YouTube video on uh, why we need smaller block sizes. Maybe I'll edit it in here and put it in here, but that was pretty interesting. Um, it was really well made and it was like, yeah, made in 2014 on like, it was like a, um, it was a uh, public service announcement for, for one megabyte Bitcoin block. Um, All right. Yeah, be interesting to see that. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, see check that. Um, the fee debt spiral. I messed uh, this slide up, but does anyone know what the fee debt spiral is? You will. Um, is that the thing uh, when uh, it runs out? You don't need uh, so. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Well, Basically, when blocks are like getting bigger and bigger, then like there's like going to be less miners, right? And then that would raise the fees, mm-hmm. and then that would result in having less miners. Is that is that it? I so I've read like two or three different types of fee debt spirals. I think that's one of them. Yeah, the another one that I heard was if you're if there are 2060 blocks and the hash rate goes down then it's going to take twice as long to reach those blocks so instead of two weeks it'll take four weeks but because it takes so long then less miners decide to mine because it's going to the difficulty is too high and then with less miners then it's just harder and harder to reach the the block um, but I think, I, I think Max, what you were saying was the one they were mentioning in the book. This was just another one that I heard, but there's like a lot of, yeah, I don't know. I, I found, I came across like two or three different answers on fee death spirals. Why did I bring that up? It's uh, just, it, you know, you're still early when like you type in fee death spiral on Chrome and like just nothing related to Bitcoin comes up. You got it. Everything I found, (laughs) even in YouTube, it's like whatever I type in, I got to add Bitcoin at the end. (laughs) 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 I know it's great. And scaling what? uh, Maybe the text is in black. I don't know. But um, that, that was just another point of contention. Uh, oh, okay. It was, it was scaling everyone. So this was interesting, right? It was, it was, it seemed that everybody was on board to increase the block size. Like everyone agreed on that, but then that's where the agreement stopped that then it was like four or two, eight, and then the doubling or whatever. But the, the fact that everyone was cool about increasing it, I thought was interesting. I'm not sure what to think about it. Um, yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's important to remember though that back then, like nearly all um, the, the nodes were like ran by the miners. So like individual nodes wasn't a thing. Um, so like it, at the, the storage space, so like, I suppose the problem is important just to, clarify what the problem was with the big blocks it was basically that the hard drives normal people wouldn't be able to run those and if they kept making it bigger and bigger eventually it would only be like thought out to its conclusion there would only be like in 100 years later like five data centers in the whole world that are doing basically kind of what's happening with ethereum now um but uh yeah it's uh that's the problem so what, what were you saying what was the point What's the question you asked, Fabian? I didn't ask a question. I was just saying that uh, it was interesting how everybody 
was an agreement on increasing the block size it seemed like oh yeah yeah um, yeah so, so yeah so it's like um none of them seem to see any problem with the fact that <laughs> normal people wouldn't really be able to run nodes in the future no i think they were making the argument that um is it a uh, moore's law that or is it melcast law i can never remember which one but the the memory would double and then every two years or something of computers that, and, that's more yeah yeah but but i think the problem with that was that the rate that the block sizes were going up weren't going to keep in line with that at all so the tendency would be for the nodes to keep centralizing out whereas now it's kind of the opposite isn't it that in in the future it's likely the nodes keep getting more decentralized because it's fixed and computing power um it's getting better and better so it would be cheaper and cheaper to run nodes yeah. so i think now just now it seems yeah should have the market spoken on it like so bitcoin cash is basically worthless now and so, yeah and I think sorry yeah light lightweight clients too or lightweight wallets are gonna get better and better i don't know how i'm not a developer but like even that technology is gonna get crazy and, and then this was an interesting idea, but it was something along the lines of how um, on-chain analysis will not be possible in the future because of how, how layer two and different, and different programs will obfuscate and change and hide like all, a lot of the transactions um yeah, yeah. What do you guys, yeah what do you guys think about that yeah well I, I was chatting with a bitcoin um kind of developer researcher guy recently and uh he was saying that uh yeah lightning is eventually going to just act as um like coin swap which is ta like taproot supposedly enables this much more than um <clears throat> than what's current that would just so like at the moment coin joins are made that's the kind of way of doing privacy with bitcoin um but coin swaps are going to become more prevalent and then if everyone's just using lightning like that's just a totally other thing and it just ruined like mass surveillance isn't really going to be possible now you can you could probably do individual surveillance like if you really wanted to figure out on one person that would be possible Mm -hmm. in some circumstances but like this whole blanket wide on chain thing that's going on now you know it, it just won't won't be plausible really that's my understanding anyway. and i believe even for lightning specifically right now if you uh, move um something from layer one to, to layer two even with if it's within like a, a channel that you have i think it's technically considered a sale on um on the on-chain metric so even there it's like it's difficult to, to classify like as soon as it's on lightning like what exactly is it still are the like coins still technically like yours or are they uh were they exchanged somewhere else and i don't know but i, I might have heard that i think taproot made that more more difficult as well to like uh, just get the the on-chain metrics um yeah. to get more like granular with that right I, I suppose what's going to happen, it's just going to end up like cash eventually. Like, mm -hmm. So, whereas like, if, if everyone's just coin swapping and doing all these things with Lightning and stuff, it's just going to make it like the history of the Bitcoin you own or whatever won't even matter. Like, even if somehow that coin swap was from some, like the typical Bitcoin criminal argument, like some big drug dealer, like it won't be attached to you just because everyone's doing it. Like the same way as like, it doesn't matter if you're, fifty dollars or fifty euros somehow came along its chain of transactions through drugs or something. Like it's just that's just the way it is. Like yeah. I, I think Bitcoin's going to end up similar. Mm -hmm. And it, I suppose if it doesn't end up similar is that would be a serious problem as well. Like with the way you know a like AI and just big data like tracking and stuff because like whether you think it or not that we have dystopian governments now, like 
it's kind of inevitable it's definitely going to happen in the future at some point and if bitcoin can't help us there like i don't know it, it wouldn't be good it, that also reminds me of the esg mind bitcoin right like they thought there would be a premium on that or that people would start using that but like no one cared um yeah, that, I, I find those narratives so funny. It's like all these corporations kind of like posturing, say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're all for that. We'll support it. And then it comes down to like some guy gets something together and goes, right, I'll sell you Bitcoin at 5% higher the price and it's ESG. And then they're like, wait, what? It's like, <laughs> we, have to, we have to pay more. No, we pay don't want it. that. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't we'll think just, you'd we'll really get... do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i i was listening to um your just just to spin off a, a little bit but um your pomp did an interview there about the space force guy during the week uh, i don't know did you guys did you listen to it max did you yeah that, that was amazing i, I would watch the show and then listen to the podcast again after um i, I just love the way I, of how he puts it i've been following him quite a bit now but um is it just thinking, like his Laurie? approach to yeah, Jason Le- Jason, Lowry or Lowry. Jason Lowry, okay. Yeah, it was just great the way, like, yeah, it was a great interview, but the point he made about the ESG narrative, like, it's like, if if you're even going to jump into that, so ne- never mind, so there, there's kind of two arguments, the way he framed it. One was um, that Bitcoin actually is getting green and cleaner, but he was saying you shouldn't even jump into that. Like, even if it's not, like, is it not worth spending a tiny fraction of the world's energy every year to, to like globally empower the globe, globally empower every country with like financial freedom and independence? And like, well, the obvious an- answer is yes, but I don't know. Yeah, you, you, I suppose you understand that when you understand Bitcoin, but if you're just looking at it, well, like we have US dollars already, then maybe you won't understand. Well, you obviously that's where these people don't understand it, but. Yeah, I think that's a better way of looking at the argument. Yeah, I think my 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 first um, like uh, article into Bitcoin and energy usage was uh, the article by Lewis Parker. Uh, he's on uh, I think it's a Chained Capital or or Unchained Capital. Um, mm-hmm. And his argument, that was the, you know, my first four-way, four-way into it. And it was like, uh, you know, yeah, you need, you need to supply this with as much energy as you can, or like the, like how you spend energy is different on the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and that was, yeah. Very and I think anytime that the energy consumption is, first of all, like a lot of time it is they use like the per transaction metric. I think Nick Carter talks about this as well, where it's just, that's just not how, how the network works. And then even in, there were articles of like comparing it to like the, the visa network, like how much lesser like energy uses, but then it's not a final settlement at that point. It's like, you usually wait, wait like weeks until that you have finality there. So I think it just really shows a lack of understanding of how the entire like network operates um where you're really comparing like apples and oranges pretty much yeah yeah just on that as well like this is insane like just how some people could be involved in this whole space for so long and just not get it but like um the the ripple co-founder was it did you see this max on on twitter there during um during the week was saying that we should fork off um no, he was saying we should make Bitcoin proof of stake. And he was basically saying that in order to get the miners to support this, you just you just pay the miners like based on the value of their capital as a ratio to the whole network. Just pay them kind of like a dividend on the staking or something like that. And like, look, not to get into the arguments ridiculous, not to get into that, but like the top top comments were like, okay, you fork the network then and do that and we'll see who who actually goes with that and she, you know no one would go with that at all but like it's just how these people like like he's top four cryptocurrency top five whatever and uh just obviously doesn't understand bitcoin at all so yeah mm-hmm. and Incredible. I, I don't want to tie brian armstrong with him but it's like these guys that are just high up there you know and and 
Yeah, I can't believe I ever use Coinbase. Like the more I learn about, it's just <laughs> such a turn off. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I still, I mean, that was my onboarding. I still <laughs> have it. So, dude, okay. So, I'm not gonna. So, have you guys used Kraken? I, I've, I have not yet. Geez, it's my Jesus Christ, dude. Kraken is so. The user interface is ridiculous. It's like. Good or bad? Like, it's like a GMAT fucking exam. <laughs> 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 I know, like, yeah, like, not conducive. I because Kraken was actually my first a funny story here, actually. Like, just around, like, just exactly what you just said. But Kraken was my first sign up there years ago. And, like, I, I imagine it was way worse now than it is, or way worse then than it is now. Mm-hmm. But, like, I was trying to figure out the banking thing, and like, I just couldn't figure it out. And their customer support was going over and back, just wasn't making any sense to me. So, like, I just got rid of them with Bitstamp, which are big in Europe. And like, I don't know, like around user experience on the exchanges, like how are they still so awful? Like most of them, it's just, I, I it's because these people, the people that build these things don't, um, they're from the Wall Street trading world. Like they're all, uh, you know, like NASDAQ mm. kind of guys. and Interactive broker. TD Ameritrade trading platforms is that what you're trying to say yeah like they're all kind of forked like talking in bitcoin speak here forked but they're like white labeled from the existing ones um that do stocks and all that so that's how they all end up looking like that but like it's starting to change like swan obviously in the us aren't they're, they're not doing that at all um and yeah strike like those kind of things so So in this part, this is the part of the book where we start getting into like different blocks actually doing stuff uh, or the small blocks doing stuff. And I thought this was so funny um, with the, uh, so Peter Todd introduced the, he was part of the small block group and he introduced the uh, RBF and that was the replace by fee. And this was like a way to like, obfuscate or like mess up big block users or big block um yeah big block users so it was it was like what so so okay so to lay out the scene it's you have uh big blocks and they're aggregating into a larger block size and then you have the small blocks but you have two different miners Um, but they're all working supposedly on the same blockchain. What you would do for a small block uh, miner or for a transaction to get into a small block is you would put out your transaction with a low fee and then you would do the transaction again, but add a higher fee. So what would happen was the larger blocks that don't care about fees, they're gonna just scoop up the first one that they see and add it into the blockchain. But the smaller block aggregators, the miners that are mining smaller blocks, they're gonna negate the first one with no fees and then grab the one with higher fees and add that into the blockchain. And what that's gonna do is more of the smaller blocks are going to get those blocks in and then it's going to make what the larger blocks the the transaction that the larger blocks do it's going to negate what they made does that make sense i totally butchered well i made that very confusing um but did that make sense i thought it was a very neat trick of like (laughs) oh it made sense to me yeah it was it was, it was, it was a cool neat trick go ahead yeah i just is the rbf like is that is what that is now like just from thinking of like the interface and like um just a normal wallet so if if i send someone so say i send if i sent you uh a transaction fabian and i said you said it with really low fee and then on the surface your wallet is saying that it's coming but there's no confirmation on it. 
Um, so it's saying that it's common, and then I can then put a higher fee on the same Bitcoin and do it to someone else, and it would cancel your one, even though you're you're expecting it to come. Is that what that is? No, Just no. A... It would cancel whatever miner got that transaction. It would cancel. It would make their block invalid. The block they made uh, yeah. invalid with that transaction. So it's like you send me. It's like you send me a, tr a transaction and then you say, oh, hold on. Oh, wait, let me resend this with a higher fee. Right. Uh, but the first transaction that you sent is going to be picked up already by a bigger block. And then the second one isn't. It's going to be picked up by the smaller block. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I get you. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's because larger blocks don't care about fees and they kind of want to do away with transaction fees. We're not do away with transaction fees, but they just, they don't want to uh, prioritize or have that be a, an issue. They just want all the transactions they can get into a block where the smaller blocks, they value more transactions. It's going to take longer, but um, that's transactions there. And now that I'm thinking about it, that's kind of, anti that kind of goes against why people or why i think that big that people that want to mine big blocks uh it would go against that because when i think people that want to mine big blocks i think they want as much transactions as they can get so they can get as much of the fees as they can get right but that that's going i guess this is i'm thinking about transactions fees in general and what this is about is the rbf first the the replaced by fee versus the first seen safe so just kind of a lot of i'm just speaking what's on my mind guys all right <laughs> <laughs> um and gavin gavin doubling down on on his big blocks and I, and we kind of paint him as the protagonist here. Um, but like, you know, he definitely wants to take the reins. He wants to push this through really, really badly. Um, and kind of just made his, made himself king. I don't know. Uh, that's yeah, not right. I, uh, that's not fair. But well, look, seemingly the longer time it, uh, he was doing, he was having a lot of bad takes on things, and just not only were they bad takes, but the way he was coming across with those takes wasn't very like yeah, like a king, like you said, which was very. I think a lot of the people that were involved in Bitcoin were kind of like people people generally will just go along with things, but even the way he did it, people were like, hold on a minute, this isn't why we're in Bitcoin. Like it's kind of so obnoxious. And you know, I think he got so frustrated, he just lost well, based on what's in this book. Yeah. He, he was just... hurting cats, right? Like developers. <laughs> They don't want to be told what to, and that's one thing that I've noticed looking at a bunch of interviews with like a different YouTube, because because a lot of his um, talks are online, and developers, d developers want to do what they want. They want to work what they want. They don't want. They don't. They don't want to work for anyone. They want to take their time. You know what I mean? They are like their own. They remind me of like. Don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> yeah, like the like the the very obnoxious George Costanza, right? That like lives in his basement of his parents' house and like doesn't want you know. He's always right, you know. That's what all these developers remind me. Of. Um, um, but it, I, how far did you guys read? Is it just chapter, chapter seven? seven. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I don't know, it gets a whole lot worse with Gavin, but it won't go <laughs> for a while. Oh, man. Um, the turning of Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you can watch some of the videos online. I watched some of them, and, like, they're really cringe, like, some of the stuff. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, his blogs were, so I started reading his earlier blogs and they were in line. The tone was in line with what the book was saying, right? It wasn't, it wasn't too, the ideas he was putting forward were, I don't want to say reasonable because I'm on the other side, but like they were, they were arguments, good arguments put forth. Um, mm. So, and then uh, all these conferences started happening, Montreal, Hong Kong, um, and then talking about SegWit. So I didn't know this and I haven't looked far into it, but I guess there's a big conspiracy on Blockstream. Does anyone know anything about it? Yeah, I know, I know a bit. Well, it says mentions <laughs> it in the book there. Yeah. That actually has, that has it talked about that yet in the book? Well, so it talked about Blockstream, but not about any conspiracy theory or like anything. Yeah, in that I, I, it's, it's probably like chapter eight then. So, so look, basically, they're just saying that uh, Blockstream make most of your money from uh, the, say, like, they make most of their revenue through ways that are not from, they, they make Side most chains. of their revenue from, from side chains. No, that was that was this chapter, I think. Yes. So, so like they're saying that um basically if the block size was raised, Blockstream would go out of business. But like I think the argument is that, and it is it does hold and it's legitimate when you're talking to them that it was actually the cause and effect here. People joined Blockstream because they believed in the small block argument, not the other way around. Like it wasn't that like. Blockstream was a massive company like Coinbase or something. And they were then saying, oh, we want to sustain our business. It was that the people were coming to Blockstream because that was the small block company. Like that's Adam Back's company. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think they talk about it a bit in the book, but I, I think I don't really buy the, the Blockstream conspiracy thing. I don't know what you guys think on it. But. I, don't, I don't know what the conspiracy is, actually. Um, well, the, well, the conspiracy is that Blockstream basically got together um, and they stopped the big blocks because all their money was being made from like solutions to scaling without um, raising the, the block size. Wow. Like. That doesn't sound like tinfoil to me, though, you know, like, I think there was a, I think there's a, I think there's a, a bigger conspiracy that's out there. Maybe, maybe I'm overblowing it, but. Well, no, no, that, that, that my understanding, that's literally it. It does talk okay. about that in the book as well. Okay. Um, and like, um, but, but I think it's, it's important to, and it talks about this in the book, you'll come across it. It, it, it's important to distinguish, like, people were joining Blockstream because they believed in the small block argument, not Blockstream. Um, it wasn't the other way around, like basically that, like, like what kind, like you could argue that, uh, I don't know, similar now, but it's actually legit that, you know, Coinbase is just promoting all these shit coins and crypto.com and all these, like, like crypto.com, you can leverage like 10X on Doge now and like, Oh yeah, what website is this? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but but like that that is kind of I I don't know what am I even trying to say. I'm trying to say that like that stuff is kind of the other way around, but it's uh, it's not relevant in this case. But basically, they're they're taking advantage of the whole crypto space and the Bitcoin name and all that to just for massive profits. Um, when all these people who are doing this are going, just going to get absolutely obliterated when like crypto winter comes or maybe just altcoin winter. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's very like short term thinking and just trying to get like as big of the market share of like the, I guess, like the crypto landscape. And it, it is this kind of like Silicon Valley, like VC type of uh, mentality that, that comes with it, right? Where I think you see like big blockers kind of came from the, that similar background there. Yeah, that, that's such, yeah, that's exactly it. Like it's um and it, I think it was the same with the big blocker mentality itself, is the kind of the Silicon Valley mindset, like products need to keep adding new features, get better and better and better. But that's not really what Bitcoin, that's not the real innovation Bitcoin brings. It's the hard monetary asset that can't be changed and censorship resistant. And yeah, we already had this conversation at the start, so 
yeah. <laughs> but 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 that's but that's exactly it, Max. Max, yeah. that's um, that's a great way of putting it. That's why I love like what Jack is working on now too, and that he's like fully bought into just Bitcoin as a whole. And I know, <laughs> did you, you guys saw Sp- Spiral? Yeah, the, the the puppet video. <laughs> oh yeah, I saw that. This. Jesus Christ! I have been I have not been on top of Twitter or anything this week or YouTube. Yeah, it's good. I was just gonna say though, like. Uh, your man Jack Dorsey has gone from Twitter like two days and they've added like Ethereum payments now or something yeah oh I saw God. that it's it was like, like the yeah. day after yeah yeah it's uh, like here we go now like in, in a year there'll probably be like 200 just shit coins like yeah. you pay on Twitter with so oh. didn't Signal do something similar as well yeah like S- Signal like th- they're coming out with their own shit coin or something that's meant to be private or whatever but like why, why would you not just use Monero? Like, if, if if you want to go down the privacy route, just use Monero or Zcash or something. Mm-hmm. Or just integrate Bitcoin and do it, like, make it all coin joins or something. But, yeah, mm-hmm. it's like, why, it's, what a way to just ruin themselves. Because they will, like, when they start pushing... I think it's only in beta or something, but they will ruin themselves when they start doing that. Um... Right when we got into Hong Kong, um, the Hong Kong meetup, uh, that's really when it was like, no one was think. how do I say this? It was like miners and companies and they were all like on the forefront or what it seemed on the forefront of like making changes and everything. And then the miners and how they say, you know, miners, you know, they were giving themselves a big pat on the back of like, um, you know, we we provide the energy and everything, right? We we really say and dictate where where the Bitcoin protocol is going, and that just always reminds me of um, how like miners serve the nodes, right? At the end of the day, everything serves the nodes, and that's just how my mentality is always when I'm thinking about. Uh, who's in control or what people are trying to do. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just when I was reading this, like, so they were going around to all these conferences, like spent God knows how much money and like all the the companies promoting this, like it actually says at the end of the book, uh, I won't ruin that bit for you because it's very interesting, but around uh, um, the the big mining company worked uh bitmain um like they they were promoting uh they spent huge amounts of money on uh promoting bitcoin cash relentlessly um but it's just like it well it, i suppose it had to happen but everyone in these conferences were convinced this was the way to go and like this is a great idea and all that when in reality like it was just an echo chamber of bad ideas really and it was prevented by, you know, the, the small blockers who grew bigger and bigger as the arguments grew. But like, it's just kind of a human thing that, you know, never, ne- first of all, never discount your ability to be wrong, even if it, everyone's sure this is the right way. And, and just to, I suppose, extrapolate that out more is that like, you know, if just if everyone's thinking something, it doesn't mean it's right. Like, and and you can everyone can just convince and sure the obvious one everyone jumps to in is Nazi Germany like back in that time like but it's the same with this like it's it's just <laughs> a bit different but um it's the same thing going on here yeah yeah and I think they mentioned like groupthink and confirmation bias a lot in the book too right where everyone's just assuming and they're thinking the same thing and then it leads them further into that it's even funny to hear like the miners like in China weren't able to support certain uh, block sizes at, at all where it seems like it's interesting that that wasn't like considered at all from some of the, the big blockers at all but again just shows like where their head was at and where they were looking at right yeah I, my, my big thing when I was just reading this I was because you obviously know how it ends like but I was just thinking oh thank god like none of this happened because well if mm-hmm we wouldn't be having this conversation here and and like none of that it just means that yeah none of this would have been possible and 
I'd be a lot, I'd have a lot more pessimistic worldview if it wasn't for Bitcoin, let's say. So, yeah. I wouldn't even know about what's going on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then we get to Lightning Network. I thought it was interesting because the big block people kept on thinking this was like filibustering, right? So the um, different protocols to like keep the big block guys from continuing. Uh, and then again, uh, what was it? Um, Gavin had Expedia, Overstock, Tiger Direct, Newegg, like all these guys kind of be like, hey, look, all these companies support, right? And this was just, just kept on thinking, you know, again, what we, we've been talking about how companies, miners, like all the people that are centralized and don't have, and have other motives or short-term thinking um, are on the side of bigger blocks and trying to push something. Uh, and everyone else is like, no, <laughs> we don't want to. Um, and then we get to Bitcoin Classic and we're not even at cash yet, but this was the next step. I was very surprised when I saw Brian Armstrong raise his support uh, for, for a lot of this stuff. And like, yeah, it makes me feel kind of icky that I, you know, that I, that I still have Coinbase. Um, and, you know, and I also thought about too, he did a big tweet storm on on the SEC. And it, as much as what, whatever you could agree or disagree on what he said, I was like, that's not the right way to go about it. Yelling at legislators from Twitter, <laughs> you know, like I, it's not, I don't know. I don't know, man, you know? <laughs> yeah, man, I don't know if you but, heard, but they, they met up, uh, wasn't there like a recent presentation where a lot of like CEOs went to present in front of, I don't know, like it was Congress or something like that. And you saw like all these big companies like send their C CEOs and Coinbase sent their CFO and someone was like, why didn't Brian go himself? <laughs> it was kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just what, sure, Brian, okay, obviously don't know the guy, but it seems that like Coinbase or they don't really understand Bitcoin. I, it sounds crazy to say it, but like, it just seems that they seem to think that the revolution is in all these old coins and like it's kind of bitcoins this old thing um and look just that that just turns me off like i'm obviously open to all the other things and there are interesting stuff but just having that as your primary kind of core just massively turns me off coinbase um and as well yeah, as this alcon casino right yeah, that, that's, that's literally it. And like some of the, like the ads that you see just for Coinbase and stuff, like just, I, there was one I saw the other day target at me. It was like this pulsing, like, um, like ship dog thing. Like I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. And, and as well, like if you're using Coinbase, you, you can bet your life, like you're going, you're getting the absolute most like tracked and like, your data is getting shared like a million places, like as they're, much as possible. They're an exchange, right? It's, it, they're not a Bitcoin custodian. Their job is to sell these products and make the spread, right? I mean. But did they, would they actually do do custodian services as well? But, uh... And they also do some education. Uh, they do have like little... Um, they do like uh, watch these videos, answer these questions about these coins and like get paid in these coins. Obviously it's not a small <laughs> amount, but, but it's still like incentive and like it is a good way to like learn about certain things, however superficially it may be, right? But um, yeah, yeah, like, like I, I'm not disagreeing with that and it's probably, well, it's definitely better that they're in the space than not, but like they could be doing a whole lot more like say, say the education like might explain what Bitcoin is, but it often now can't speak specifically to Coinbase. So I haven't looked through it, but it would lead you to believe that like, okay, this is where it started with Bitcoin. And now the next things are like insert coin of the week here. Like this is going to be the next thing. And then 
it's kind of like they're they're the kind of VC Silicon Valley crypto company that they don't they like they're the same as these guys that they don't these kind same as the big block guys in this sure Coinbase is like the main company in it so um I just don't think they've really changed at all in their perspectives from when this is in the book now look I'm making a lot of statements there <laughs> but um <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. won't hold you again. we won't hold you to them <laughs> and I'd also lost. argue that like them sorry go ahead Jack I go on I'm just going to say Coinbase lawsuit for like mm-hmm. libel or something <laughs> defamation <laughs> I was just going to say like them being a publicly traded company probably almost like the, the result of that is, is they probably have a bit of a higher time preference with that now just because they're constantly uh, need to be like aware of like quarterly results and that right so a lot of what they do is they're probably like financially incentivized to, to push all these other tokens and who knows to what extent like um i don't want to say that they get paid paid like based on those but um it, just the way that a lot of the uh the coins are distributed we don't really know um <laughs> how much of those that they have right or the kind of the financial incentives behind those yeah, well, that's actually definitely true. Coinbase, like, I think they hold, like, a bit of Bitcoin. They don't say how much, but they hold numerous shit coins, like, and God knows, God knows what they're, you know, like, you see, this is the thing, like, if Coinbase just do a marketing campaign, like, let's say they spend, like, a couple hundred thousand dollars and promote SHIB, or, or in fact, they, they change their core marketing, um, so they, they keep the marketing budget the same, but they put everything onto SHIB for like a certain demographic and they hold a lot of SHIB. Now, I'm not saying they do, maybe it's different coins. The price of SHIB is going to go up like 400% or whatever. And like, it's, um, you know, then they could just cycle that back out. And I don't think they have to, they, I don't think they have to disclose like what coins they hold or anything like that. It's just, the, it's the dollar amount of those coins. So, yeah, like I've no doubt there's things like that going on, and yeah, it's it just yeah, just Coinbase, and it's look, it's the same with a lot of the big like Crypto.com. That I don't know mm-hmm. how big they are in the US. I think they're pretty big, but they're absolutely massive. Um, or in Canada as well, but they're absolutely massive here in Europe. Um, they've I think their headquarters in Dublin actually. Um, oh really? And like my god they just the, the promotions like whatever about what you were saying about coinbase fabian like i don't think they do edu- like what i was saying to you earlier like they don't i don't think they do education but like as i said the ad was literally like trade 10x leverage now on doge like on crypto.com on our retail exchange platform like it's just how you know how many people are going to get ruined because of that like yeah 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 yeah, their marketing budget has just been absolutely insane. Um, I think they, it's, I don't know that the exact number, but the, the Staples Center, for example, in LA now is the crypto.com arena. Like they have like, I think UFC sponsorships, they, even like a soccer team. So like a lot of like sports uh, sponsorship deals that they're like just heavily investing into. Like I was watching a basketball game yesterday. It was like Coinbase all over the arena. Someone had like a crypto.com logo on the jersey. So it's... Um, and I guess like that demographic is probably more likely to get into the uh, the leverage trading as well, like those that are like into Definitely. sports betting. Well, it, it's like at that gamified. point, it really isn't that different, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it, it's gamified, right? I mean, everything mm-hmm. everything is gamified. Marketing is gamified, and now and that's just bleeding into here. My so so I, I think our big concern or our our big concern is is like. It's like separating Bitcoin from everything else, right? It's it, and mm-hmm. and and I have this problem whenever I like talk to someone about Bitcoin for the first time. I always have to make the statement of like, I'm only talking about Bitcoin. I'm not talking. I'm separating it, right? But but you can say that, and after the conversation, they might remember, they might not, you know. But I think that's like, right? It's like one of those things where where we really try to to separate the two and that's just a big that's just a struggle and that's just going to be life until you know 
Bitcoin as a unit of account, you know? (laughs) Yeah, like, I think, yeah, I think it's like it comes down to, like, all the people at Crypto.com and all them are pulling to the space with the various shit coins and all that is ultimately good for the space. And they will all end up in Bitcoin and understand on some level the things that we're talking about here eventually. But it's going to be a lot rougher along the way for those people than it could be if like the right education and kind of motives and I don't know, structures and all that were put in place. Um, and it's just, it's interesting, like what you said about crypto.com there sponsoring like all these stadiums and teams and stuff. And it's like, I'm reading the field standard as well at the moment. And it's like, it, that it's kind of, and this is separate, but it's an interesting point. It's kind of like peak fiat, like they're using the fiat system to like raise these hundreds of millions of dollars to do these things. Um, when it is totally crazy, really, when it's just when you think about it, like it's, it's mad, but yeah, that, that's the discussion for the fiat standard, I suppose. It's different. <laughs> All right, Jack. So what what uh, what's in store for us for uh, chapters eight through fourteen? We're done, are we? Yeah, that's chapter seven, Bitcoin Classic. Uh, the short chapter. Uh, yeah, it's very good. It's, uh, yeah, um, yeah. To how the book goes, like a lot of the characters that have been talked about now will start to kind of disappear, um, and like yeah. Like the lot, there's a load of stuff about Craig Wright. Do you know that guy? The the, the fake fake, fake Toshi. Toshi. I know. I so I just saw an article on him about winning a lawsuit for. <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? It was like yeah, uh, depending on the the source, the it might not be fully accurate. <laughs> it's crazy, like the amount of like different. Uh, I've, I've read. <laughs> Which, which is what happened. A lot of the Bitcoin guys start slandering him and all that and saying all this stuff that was actually defamatory. And then okay. he just went and sued them all um, because he has a lot of money to do so. But like, basically, he, he came out and he said, and there's loads of videos around this. You'll, have, you'll enjoy watching them on, on YouTube, or whatever. But uh, he came out and said he was Satoshi or whatever. And then he basically never proved it um and he gave just kept giving all these weird answers rather than just like taking the keys which he said he had and signing a message to show that it was him he just never did it and anyway he just started a load of the bit the big blockers threw their weight and behind them and just destroyed the credibility of the whole thing and uh it's, it's still going on like that's the guy that's suing like um I think there's it's got like tens of millions of dollars now uh, on um, Peter McCormick, the What Bitcoin Did guy. The, okay. There's a massive spat going on. But uh, yeah, it's it's very, very interesting reading. And he's the guy that came out with the Bitcoin Satoshi vision thing, which just, that was just a massive, I think there's like no block size on that or something. Like a scam like. <laughs> so I'll be laughing a lot then. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's very enjoyable. Awesome. That was a great book, though, Fabian. Great. Um, well done on that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it looked like it just flowed right into it. So, um, yeah, looking forward for, for next week. Right, guys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully right. we'll have a few more again. <laughs> yeah, and we'll see. Yeah. Uh, the, we should the, do it, I think. The author is like not, he doesn't, he's like laying low. Like um, he's not very active on anything. Um, I found him on Twitter though. Um, his did, DMs are open. Okay. Well, well, maybe I didn't find him. I don't know. I'll check again, but uh, all right. All right, guys. With that, okay. let's uh, call it a day and I'll see you guys next week. Or we'll Can see each other next you? week. Thank you.